Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stacey Penham with QSR International. So thank you for joining us today for this uh, webinar on doing qualitative research in a digital world, uh, qualitative research and innovation webinar series that we're partnering with. Um, it's in, in vivo and uh, Sage Publishing uh, to bring this to you. So uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And I'm just uh, while people are joining, um, I'm just going to introduce myself and um, my partner at Sage. Uh, so again, my name is Stacy Pena. I'm the Invivo Community Director here at QSR, and at the end, I'll talk to you more about the Invivo Community, and then um, who I've been working with uh, to put this webinar series together is Ali Owen. Uh, she had a work commitment, so she couldn't make it today, but I just wanted to thank her for her work. Um, it's, it's been fun uh, working with her on uh, uh, organizing the webinar series. Um, and I also just wanted to let you know how you can uh, ask questions throughout. Um, so there is a question area at the bottom. So with GoToWebinar, you have a orange box with a white arrow on top. If you click on the white arrow, you'll, it'll open that menu for you and you'll see the question area. Feel free to answer questions at any time. We will take the questions at the end though. Um, also, this is being recorded. So a few days after the webinar, we'll send you an email with a recording. Uh, we also have a handout with all the slides you'll be seeing today. Um, so again, if you go to the handout section, you can just download that if you'd like. Um, and everyone is on mute just so it's easier for you to hear our presenters. Uh, so with that, I am going to introduce our presenters. Uh, so first, uh, Dr. Trina Paulus. Uh, she's the director at the Office of Undergraduate Research and Creative Activities and a professor um, in the research division of the family medicine um, at Gwilin College of Medicine at East Tennessee State University. And with her, uh, Jessica Lester, Dr. Jessica Lester will be presenting. She's Associate Professor of Inquiry Methodology um, in the School of Education at Indiana University. Uh, so welcome, Trina and Jessica. Thank you. And Trina, I'm going to make you the presenter now. How does that look, Stacy? Excellent, we can see the PowerPoint. Okay, wonderful. I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica to get us started this morning. All right, well, hello everyone, and, and thank you, Stacy. Thank you again to Sage and QSR in vivo for the invitation to share with you all today. Just a little bit about myself. As Stacy mentioned, I'm Jessica Lester. I'm an associate professor in the Inquiry Methodology, Research Methodology Program um, in um, Indiana University, um, which is located in Bloomington, Indiana in the US. My area of research and teaching focuses broadly in the domain of qualitative methodologies and methods, um, but I particularly focus um, on discourse and conversation analysis with much of this work positioned at the intersection of critical disability studies and mental health. I also engage in qualitative methodological work um, around broader concerns. Uh, and this ranges from focusing on um, exploring the ways that we establish quality and qualitative research uh, to more recently examining the use of shared data sets. And of course, for many years now, I've been particularly interested in methodological work uh, at the intersections of digital tools and spaces uh, and qualitative research. Hi, everyone. I'm Trina Paulus, and I am a professor here at East Tennessee State University, where I work with undergraduate research programs um, and also with family medicine in the research division. Um, my methodological interest is in research technologies broadly, um, and that in part comes from my background in instructional design and technology. Um, I've specifically been working in the area of developing methods for analyzing online conversations, um, something that all of us are doing a lot more of these days. Uh, and like Jessica, I primarily use language-based methods like discourse and conversation and narrative analysis. Um, and I'm currently working on a study of communication skills for health professionals um, by analyzing video-based um, interactions with standardized patients um, in the medical education context. So over the last decade, we've been uh, collaborating together on practices and considerations related to digital tools in spaces and qualitative research. 
So to begin, I'm going to share a little bit about how our collaborative work has really grown uh, over the last decade, and specifically share a bit about the shifts that are evidenced in the publication of our newest book, uh, Doing Qualitative Research in the Digital World. So in 2014, Trina and myself, uh, as well as our UK-based colleague, Paul Dempster, collaborated in writing our first book on this topic. This book, um, which was titled Digital Tools for Qualitative Research, was published in the UK by SAGE. Uh, and we really wrote about the idea of using digital tools across the research process. That's the term that we use in this first book. At the time, we were relatively new researchers learning about available technologies that we thought maybe would support our qualitative work, as well as the work of our many graduate students and colleagues who were interested in developing skill sets in these areas. So for both Trina and myself, it was really our graduate students who were driving our study, and this is still the case, um, really driving our study of new technologies and their potential intersection with qualitative research practices. They were the ones that came to us with new ideas, new skills, greater, um, at least than us, familiarity even, of what was out there. So in many ways, our first book offered our first pass at thinking about how to use digital tools across the research process. We wrote really relatively little about methodology or even about how technologies might shape methodology and vice versa. Indeed, there was a notable gap in the methodological literature. Um, there was really a singular focus on digital tools as being equal to qualitative data analysis software, and relatively little else um, had been considered. So uniquely, um, we argued in our first book for really envisioning tools as pervading the entirety of the qualitative research process. So since our first book has come out, um, we've had the privilege of teaching special topics courses at our respective institutions, organizing panels and special interest groups at conferences, and giving talks and publishing on the topic of digital tools, as well as qualitative research. In the years since our first book, um, we've gra also gathered uh, a great deal of feedback from students and colleagues, and we transitioned from SAGE in the UK to SAGE in the US. And we've really used the feedback to write this revised uh, and reimagined new book. It's certainly not a second edition in the traditional sense, um, as just technology has evolved since 2014, so has our thinking on this topic. So in our new book, we foreground qualitative research design and to some extent background the technological landscape, while at the same time noting throughout our realization that the two are inseparable. That is the material, material world of digital tools uh, and the social world of human activity cannot be neatly teased apart. In our second book, we've also expanded our original notion of digital tools into the more comprehensive digital world uh, to really encompass not only tools, but also spaces. For us, this expansion has come alongside our recognition of the importance of engaging in a continual critical appraisal of how the adoption of new technologies is necessary um, and how they transform our research practice. So in our, in our new book, rather than thinking about the use of digital tools across the research process, we offer this idea of developing a digital research workflow. And this is a term that was used by our students. So with this overview of, of some of the core distinctions between our two books, I'm just going to offer um, a general overview of what we'll be talking about today. So first, um, I'm going to begin by sharing a bit about our thinking around how methodology is always already shaped by the historical moment uh, and how our use of digital tools and engagement in the digital world as researchers is really no exception to this. Then second, um, I'll briefly share some of the critiques uh, and feedback we received around our 2014 book, specifically the way we conceptualized and theorized, um, or perhaps didn't theorize, uh, digital tools and qualitative research. And then third, I'll speak to how we now have come to center the importance of theorizing technology use and illustrate how we invite qualitative researchers and the qualitative research community writ large to do this as well. Fourth, 
We'll both be sharing how this theorization has really spurred us to engage in a reflexive use of digital tools and engagement in the digital world. Um, and to speak to this, we'll be offering several examples specifically related to the use of in vivo software um, as part of a digital uh, research workflow. And then finally, Trina is going to conclude by offering some understandings of how to move this way of thinking about digital tools and spaces forward for us as qualitative researchers. So as um, you may know, there's a lot going on in the United States at the moment. This is where we're both located. And of course, this is also true of the larger world as well. Um, really over the last few months, many qualitative researchers have seen their research shut down um, and or have been required to entirely rethink and redesign how to go about studying human meaning making in digital spaces or with the support of digital tools. For many, uh, turning towards the digital has become really the only option for moving forward given the pandemic, um, as well as what some scholars have begun to write about and think about how this historical moment might very well shape how we envision the very doing of qualitative research in the coming years as well. Um, so of course, the idea of history as shaping methodology uh, is not new to us as qualitative researchers. Methodology um, is, in fact, a historical artifact. It's always evolving, it's always shifting, and hopefully is also responsive to the moments and contexts wherein it is being wielded. And of course, um, it is shaped by, or should be shaped by, the communities and people who participate in our research as well. So indeed, the present, his, the present moment of history is really remaking um, our qualitative methodologies and our technologies and the two always intersect. We really feel that now more than ever, there are important consequences and outcomes to our research practices. We certainly need sound qualitative research that is engaged uh, in socially just participatory methods, methods that turn toward doing research with, not on, people to support answering questions that matter to their lives and matter to their communities. So in this um, historical moment, we know, uh, really as we lean into lessons from the past, that qualitative methodologies are and will change. Um, they will be continually responding to the present moment. And this response, we believe, intersects with technologies and particularly generative ways, but not neutral ways. So in the realm of research, as in social life more generally, Technology is always fraught with real consequences, political consequences and equitable access. These are realities we cannot escape when thinking with technologies as qualitative research researchers. Um, some of these real consequences um, are what we'll be thinking with you all about today, particularly as related to the qualitative research process. Um, but to move us forward, um, we've come to see the importance of starting with theorizing technology. So this is where we're going to start today. While in our first book, we really skipped over this, um, or um, if you're being generous, at best we skimmed by it. Um, now we're arguing that uh, theorizing technologies is a really critical starting point, um, a really useful one. So how can we think about theorizing technologies? So if you look at the literature around technology and qualitative research over the years, um, you might conclude uh, that qualitative researchers traditionally adhere to a view of technological determinism. And Trina, can you move to the next slide? Trina is having uh, technical difficulties. I can make myself presenter and show the slides for you. Jessica? That would be great. I don't, uh, Trina, okay. are you having technical difficulties? Okay, so let me do, hold on, just give me a second. Okay, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so I'll just go to the slide you're on. Here you go. Yep, perfect. Thank you so much, Stacey. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, okay, just to back us up a little bit. So if, if we were to look at the literature um, around technology and qualitative research over the last um, couple of years, um, it would be fair to conclude that qualitative researchers traditionally have adhered to a view of technological determinism. And this is the view that humans are passive and must adapt to changes that technology imperatives really force upon them. Um, so this is a very popularized view, uh, quite common. Examples of this can be heard in statements such as, everyone says I should use software, so my study is more, more rigorous, so I guess I have to do it. Um, this implicit view of technology is one that often assumes that the intrinsically best, most efficient technology will be adopted, regardless of the context. So someone might say something like, what's the best QDA software, period, with context not being a point of consideration. So in our, our new book, um, we take this on, um, but just say a little bit more about the position we took up in our first book. In the first book, we also wanted to counter this technological deterministic view. Um, so in our first book, without really thinking about it, we implicitly adopted a different theory of technology, one that positions technology, not humans, uh, as passive and value neutral. Within this viewpoint, qualitative researchers would be conceptualized as retaining control of the software, for example, and the software um, is understood as not controlling the study. Technology then, um, from this perspective, would be merely instrumental and might even be positioned as what human researchers can use to you know, create a more rigorous study or set of findings, um, as the technology itself is understood to be neutral and exists solely for um, the user. So this view is one that allows us to enact certain strategies using software tactics but ultimately it is up to us to plan for how to use technology. So in many ways, this is an optimistic view of technology, one wherein humans retain control of innovations and always decide whether to use them or not. So a short while after we published our first book, um, I ran across a book entitled Researching a Post-Human World, uh, Interviews with Digital Objects, which was written by Catherine Adams and Terry Lynn Thompson. And their book makes visible um, how research practices and ways of being in the world are increasingly intermingled, intertwined uh, with digital technologies. Uh, and many of their insights are situated within uh, new materialistic perspectives and post-humanistic thinking, uh, which I'm sure many of you know is a perspective that has really come into view in, in the field of qualitative research in the last few years. So a few chapters into reading their book, I came across a reference to our first book. Um, it wasn't just any reference, it was a critique, a strong critique of our instrumental view of technology. And one of their main arguments was that we said in our first book that reflexivity is important, uh, but we didn't really illustrate that. Uh, and they called us out, of course, on this instrumental view of technology use. So this critique really pushed our theorization of technology forward. Uh, and this is something that we write about in our new book. Also, um, we did not know uh, at the time how important that would become in 2020, um, where, um, as you all know, um, so many of us are now all living in and through technology. Could you go to the next slide, please, Stacey? So in our new edition of the book, we take the stance that new technologies require particular changes in practice. Um, they neither require particular changes in practice, which would be technological determinism, but neither is a given technology a neutral tool with no influence at all, which would be an instrumental view. So um, it is neither and it is both. So from individual researchers retaining agency um, over their use of tools to the mutual shaping of tool and research practice to an investigation of how those with power are influencing how particular tools and practices are constructed and adopted what is given is that the relationship between our tools and practices, um, these digital confluences as Adams and Thompson have named them, we must carefully consider them. Um, but a central question here is how? Um, how do we as qualitative researchers engage in this careful consideration? So in our book, we argue that it is through intentionally attending to the perspectives, the attitudes and beliefs that shape research design decisions and meaning making, including the use of technology that allows us to engage in this critical appraisal. 
So we suggest that this making sense or careful consideration requires going beyond a focus on digital tools uh, to creating a strong theoretical foundation to help explain their intersections with the social world. One of my favorite um, quotes around this is written by Trina Paulus and two of her colleagues, Jackson and Davidson, in 2017, they, they, they wrote, and I quote them here, these explorations should also take us beyond specific tools into new theoretical territory. These are questions we may only begin to ask if we engage in forms of reflexivity that push beyond simplistic opinions about the broad influence of technology in our work, as though it is monolithic or the specific technological tools we use as though they are fixed. Next slide, please. So um, when first starting to think about um, theories of technology and qualitative research, um, that is to spend time in this theoretical territory as Paulus and our colleagues noted, how do we begin this kind of reflexive conversation with digital tools and spaces as co-researchers with us? So to begin this process, at the end of every chapter in our new book, um, we pose questions to help us um, as qualitative researchers get there. And these questions um, are informed by Adams and Thompson's book that you see here on the screen. And they are a challenge to us, and they're our challenge to you all today as well. So to dive deeper into this, we're going to walk through what it might mean for us to engage in a critical appraisal of technology and qualitative research and envision our work with digital tools and spaces as always already entangled and embedded and engaged in the research process with us as co-researchers. So um, we're, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So we're going to be framing this reflexive engagement with our digital workflows as critical appraisal questions. And we'll specifically talk through how three aspects of our research workflows um, can be impacted by the use of digital tools um, and why it's important to critically appraise these shifts. Um, these three aspects we'll be speaking about are collaborative data analysis, um, social media as a data source, um, and conducting literature reviews. Next slide. Okay, so even though we've emphasized in both books how important it is to think about the use of technology across the research process, rather than waiting until data is um, in hand to figure out how or whether to use software, we do indeed realize that this is exactly what people do. Um, and in fact, acknowledging this reality is part of holding a reflexive position uh, when it comes to the relationship between methodology and technology. So, we're starting here with a critical appraisal related to using digital tools to deal with our research data. And we ask here, how does the use of software invite, discourage, scaffold, um, or frame uh, collaborative data analysis? Um, and by working through these dilemmas, uh, we can really start to critically appraise what can happen when tools like InVivo are part of the digital workflow. workflow. Next slide. Thank you. So in our experience, um, software can actually discourage collaboration. Um, there are many um, qualitative data analysis software packages out there now from InVivo, MaxQDA, Atlas TI, and that's just naming a few of them. And historically, it was not possible to work across these platforms. And this was particularly true before the launch of the REFI um, QDA XML exchange. Um, when a set of data that was analyzed in MaxQDA could not be opened and continue to be analyzed in InVivo, for example. Um, so unless everyone on your research team had access to the same software, uh, there was really no way to work collaboratively with the data. Um, the new exchange could very well shift this landscape, however. Um, software companies that are participating uh, in the REFI QDA XML exchange do invite a new way of handling research data across platforms. Um, but this certainly depends on how complicated or straightforward the process proves to be. Next slide. So a very significant way that software can indeed invite collaborative handling of and analysis of data is by offering a cloud-based version of the software. Um, Deduce uh, was one of the first companies to do so, uh, and it's my understanding that InVivo now also offers a cloud-based solution for small research teams. 
you know, being able to access your data via the cloud at the same time for synchronous project work is really key to collaboration today. So this is just one example of how introducing software will change the research workflow in a relevant methodological way that certainly needs serious reflexive attention. Next slide. One of the really exciting features of our new book uh, is the over 40 vignettes that are included. And these are real world examples written by scholars, um, qualitative researchers, who illustrate their engagement with digital tools and spaces in very practical ways, alongside reflexive attention to the consequences of, of that engagement. So here on this slide is one example. Um, we include here an excerpt from Dr. Bryant's vignette in which she shares how she makes decisions about which software packages to use. Her mention of how a single interface across platforms that deduce offers invites collaboration with, with others um, is noted here. She notes too that the end capture feature of InVivo invites analysis of social media in ways that other software packages um, do not. Um, and this leads us to the second example of ways to meaningfully engage in reflexivity around aspects of a digital workflow, and that is social media as data, um, which uh, hopefully Trina will be unpacking for us today. Trina? <laughs> I'm here, I'm back. Sorry, everybody. Um, and if I disappear, Jessica, I'll have to, to hand it back to you. My computer doesn't seem to like a uh, go-to meeting. Um, so thanks, Jessica. Um, introducing qualitative data, and actually we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, introducing qualitative data analysis software into a research, flow, re research workflow actually does invite the use of larger data sets than we could ever tackle by hand. Um, the ability of some of the packages to extract and directly import tweets, to organize them by variables of interest and autocode for particular keywords chosen by the researcher, all of these features invite a new type of data into the world of qualitative research. Software like InVivo can scaffold and frame the very way that this data is handled. Now, this invitation has not gone unnoticed by qualitative researchers, though it's not necessarily been uh, graciously accepted. Because social media data really has presented all of us, especially qualitative researchers, with something of a methodological dilemma. Um, but given how often, especially now, our lives are playing out in electronically mediated ways, we can't really ignore this layer of interaction if we want to study the human experience. But online conversations as a possible source of data are so vast and unwieldy that our traditional methods are not really suited for it. Next slide, please. So this does lead to our second set of reflexivity questions, which is how can qualitative data analysis software solve these methodological dilemmas? In what ways would human actors and material artifacts come together to do this? And how is this coming together going to alter our methods through transformation, possible resistance, um, or even constraining what we're used to doing traditionally? Next slide. As Jessica pointed out earlier, methods are always entangled in historical moments. So for us today in 2020, uh, this is not only the COVID moment, but the social media infiltrated world that we do find ourselves in. Uh, so as Dr. Bryant pointed out in her vignette, uh, digital tools can be used to transform our practices in order to better, better understand the moments that we are living in. Next slide. In our second example, we're sharing an extract here from Dr. Fassbender's vignette. And in this, he specifically noted the importance of large data sets to his research workflow. He draws on YouTube videos and comments among other social media data sources. So working with these videos and comments, it can pose a methodological dilemma. Human researchers must come together with material artifacts that could be the YouTube posts, Google Chrome, and Capture, and in vivo, to literally transform this workflow. Dr. Fassbender notes, too, that the literature review is part of this workflow, with some of the same actors in Capture, Google Chrome, PDFs, transforming this part of the research process as well. 
So thinking through what this digital research workflow should look like for your study and how to create it, this is really the point of the book. Next slide. Creating digital workflows it does necessitate change. So many of us working in this area, we really just want to say to people who are resistant to technological change, come on now, get on, get on board already. Uh, just adopt the tools. They offer really cool things. And we really want people to change. We want the humans to change in order to um, create a digital workflow. And this is kind of what we implied in our first book. We almost were chiding people who were likely simply being wary or even people who were more reflexive than we were at the time. Um, we were kind of feeling like they were being deterministic thinkers um, and not just getting on board. But it isn't just the humans who actually need to adapt to what the tools offer. Um, we're going to kind of illustrate how the tools also may need to change in order to get to our ideal digital workflow. So for me, um, part of my ideal digital workflow does include a seamless process for conducting a paperless literature review from start to finish. Something that to fully achieve will not only require changes to my practices as a researcher, but also to the currently available tools. Next slide. Our third example then um, is about literature reviews. So literature reviews are an integral part of pretty much every research tradition. And many of us old timers learned to conduct them the old fashioned way in a physical library building with print journals, books and stacks, card catalogs, pencils, and other tools. Our thinking really is intertwined with our engagement with the material world. So shifting to a paperless process of reading, writing, thinking, and arguing is really not a small ask. Um, it is a new type of practice that does require a lot of changes on the part of humans. As it turns out, as we've talked to people about this idea of going paperless, we found that people really do feel strongly about their relationship with paper. So right now, the digital workflow that we describe in our book requires actually a sequence of tools moving from cloud-based storage devices um, where we can store the electronic versions of our literature sources. And these have to sync with apps on digital readers in order to annotate those uh, PDFs um, electronically. Then we have to be sure that that syncs with whatever citation management system we may have chosen, such as EndNote. And then we want to be able to import these annotated literature sources into data analysis software for analysis. One, one insight that we've gained over the years is that literature reviews are basically data analysis projects, qualitative data analysis projects. And so we should be able to harness the power of the tools um, to perform that analysis. So that's a lot of tools. So the ideal workflow for me would actually eliminate the need for one or more of these systems with maybe EndNote changing to actually support the coding and analysis of these texts, or perhaps in vivo integrating a site as you write functionality that would allow us to generate references once we were done with the analysis. Next slide. For example, Dr. Emerson, and this is an extract from her vignette, she wrote about how EndNote, Microsoft Word, and InVivo together comprise her digital literature review workflow. This excerpt highlights the importance of understanding how these tools work or do not work together. So being reflexive around what software invites and disinvites how it scaffolds new ways of being with the literature, how it transforms or resists our methodological workflows, and what changes are needed to both human and non-human actors. These issues are all integral to creating a digital workflow in a meaningful way. Next slide. So there are, of course, many more examples of digital tools and spaces that need to be critically appraised as we think about uh, incorporating them, in, them into our new workflow, especially given where we find ourselves in 2020. In the middle of a political upheaval and a global pandemic, we find ourselves asking how we might move forward as social science researchers in this historical moment in ethical, consequential, meaningful ways without just uncritically accepting technology is always the solution. 
So while we agree that the ability to now do interviews via Zoom, for example, is exciting um, as we're all looking for new ways to um, carry on with our research, disability studies scholars such as Kirschbaum and Price um, have argued that while some researchers have thoughtfully considered the significance of such digital interviewing methods, methods there's really still a normative body mind that is central in most portrayals of the interview setting. So we're gonna offer a final set of critical appraisal questions for your consideration. Uh, next slide. What are the ethical and political consequences of these digital workflows? Who is included? Who is excluded? Who has the power and privilege and who is vulnerable? So we might wonder, well, how political can adopting qualitative data analysis software really be? And indeed, you know, we, we have emphasized in both of our books that most, if not all, software packages um, in the qualitative realm were actually grassroots efforts. They were developed from the ground up by researchers for researchers. Um, and this kind of implies that these companies are good guys. They're not just greedy corporate actors. They are being inclusive and trying to think first of researcher needs. Next slide. However, as we all rush to figure out how to move our social science research methods online, let's not forget the simple fact that 1.3 billion people do not even have electricity. In 2012, that was just shy of 20% of the global population. So this does challenge our assumptions that by using digital tools and engaging in digital spaces, we're somehow automatically expanding our reach or improving access to participants or embracing solutions to research barriers. In terms of data analysis software, then people with electricity and access to computers are included in this move. Students and academics and nonprofits are included in that there are institutional uh, licenses or discounted licenses for certain users. However, people without money to buy the software or institutions that don't provide the software or don't have people who don't have access to training or support, they're all excluded. And while, yes, there are free and open source options, um, they're really only going to work if you are techie enough to have programming skills or patient enough to regroup when the free software options disappear. Recently, the software company Quirkos uh, did post on their blog about some of these accessibility issues, along with offering a less expensive version of the software to people working in particular lower income countries. And we commend um, moves like that, especially now. We also acknowledge uh, Nigel Fielding's many writings around what it means to do research with people and not on them. Um, and that would include using technologies in ways that work for particular participants and communities. Um, and he's also written about how to support the efforts of citizen scientists and how mobile devices are making new types of research possible in certain areas. Next slide. So we must complicate by engaging in some theorizing the implications of working at the intersection of qualitative research and digital spaces and tools. Of course, Jessica and I are still fans of using digital tools and a great deal of the book really focuses on what new tools and spaces are out there, what's available. We provide lots of practical examples of how we might engage with them. But today we just wanted to highlight that doing this does need to attend to the dialectical relationship between tools, humans, methodological practice, and the social world because our choices do have consequences. Next slide. So with this theoretical and historical overview of the context of um, our thinking as we were writing, we'd like to close by offering a sneak preview of the content. So, so far you've seen um, excerpts from three vignettes that are in the book from the on the ground researchers who have struggled with methodological entanglements. Um, each chapter contains even more vignettes um, than we are showing here. Um, even in these slides, these are just a select few. So in the first three chapters of the book, we cover collaboration and reflection practices, qualitative research design, and the relationship of methodology and technology and its impact on design. And we take a look, we kind of position qualitative data analysis software as a hub for your research workflow. Next slide. In chapters four to six, we share tips for creating an entirely paperless literature review, literature review process. We distinguish between pre-existing digital spaces as a potential source of data and the use of digital tools to generate data. Next slide. Finally, 
in the last three content chapters, we cover innovations in transcribing practices, ways to think about managing and analyzing data, and how to engage in writing and representing findings in ways that support being a networked public scholar. None of these practices are neutral, obvious, inevitable, or inconsequential. Um, so our hope is that today we've given you some ways to critically appraise your development of a digital research workflow. Next slide. So we thank you for the chance to talk through some of these ideas, and we hope that this sparks conversation and debate with all of us who care about working in the intersection of research and technology. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Trina and Jessica. That, that was great, very informative. So while people are typing in more questions, and I just want to remind people that the handout is available under the handouts, you can download it. And also we are recording this, so you'll get the recording a couple of days from now. Um, and then I just also, we um, uh, with Sage, uh, just wanting you to you know how you can uh, uh, get their book. Um, it's You can pre-order it and with the handout, all the links are live. So you can just use the handout to get to the right um, <clears throat> areas to order the book and it'll be available in December. So that's exciting. And I just wanted to let you know some of the upcoming events that the NVivo community is um, <clears throat> is organizing. So again, with um, our partner Sage Publishing, we have uh, three more webinars for the fall series. Uh, so you can um, go here and register for them if you haven't already. They're all going to be very helpful and informative. And we are working on a spring series too that will come out um, uh, shortly. And if you haven't already, we have uh, our Invivo podcast, which is really all about how qualitative and mixed methods researchers um, uh, work in their field. Um, so it's about their research. Uh, it's on pretty much any uh, podcast uh, platform you, you can find out there, but it's also on our website. So feel free to, to check that out and share it. Um, we, we just had our Invivo virtual conference that was on September 23rd. It uh, went very well, lots of great content. You can still register and participate on the on-demand, which you will have till December 22nd. So if you want to register and um, if you join the community, you get a, a discount promo code for that. Uh, and then the community. So this is, um, so I, I just wanted to agree with Trina when she said, you know, the developers of QDA software. I think we do consider ourselves the good guys. That's one reason we've created the NVivo community is to really help researchers connect with each other. Uh, so the idea is it's a global network within disciplines across organizations and it's really a community of practice and, and I have a passion for this because I, I did my own dissertation, qualitative dissertation a few years back and I just really enjoy um, being able to work with researchers and talk to them about their research. So to join the community you'll be notified about upcoming events and also ways to help participate in the community. So that'd be great if you would like to join. So with that, um, I wanted to go to questions. So what I'll do is I will read questions to, to both of you. Um, so let me just, sorry, find some here. Um, so one question um, is uh, for PhD research focuses on recording and the pre preservation of indigenous elder stories and cultural practice. So oh, maybe she just wanted to tell us about her, her research. I don't know if you have any insight on that. Um, oh, um, here's one. Uh, there is skeptic skepticism regarding qualitative research. There is less of an acceptance and management here in India. They rather prefer quantitative with hypothesis formation and testing. I, I don't know if you both find that or have any comments about it. Um, I think it depends on the discipline and every, what I always talk with my students about is that every discipline is at a different place in the trajectory towards their understanding of and acceptance of methods other than randomized controlled experiments <laughs> or quantitative <laughs> methods. Uh, you know, social science, you know, as a social science researcher, I mean, I definitely see 
um, have worked with students whose fields are at very different points on that continuum. So I think it's understanding where your field is and how to engage in a conversation that might help them sort of see where qualitative methods can play a role to answer questions that quantitative methods just cannot. Jessica, I don't know if you have some thoughts on that too. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree that discipline is um, certainly going to shape um, your understanding and others' understanding of kind of where qualitative research is positioned, as well as obviously the geographic location in which you are doing your disciplinary work um, in that folks um, have a range of familiarity with qualitative research. One thing that I think is really useful, particularly when you're engaging in conversation, be it through a potential publication or, or in other outlets, um, with folks that might be less familiar or skeptical about qualitative research is to connect um, really closely to the fairly large body of scholarship and qualitative research about establishing quality. Um, so whatever qualitative methodology you're using, becoming really familiar with what's been written about um, the, the, the way to think about how quality is established. Um, many methodologies have really teased out the way you do that. And what that can do is it can um, help you speak the language of validity, so to speak, um, to an audience that might be more familiar with a particular discourse around quality. Um, and so making connections to your qualitative work and that body of literature I found in my own, my own scholarship, particularly when publishing um, in um, more medically oriented contexts where qualitative research is less less familiar, and that that's a really effective way to begin to um, inch my way into a conversation, um, even about what qualitative research is. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a question, is, is it really possible to capture phenomenological issues in research work without meeting or um, internal, Doctors in person, uh, for example, when you're interviewing and on issues where emotions, reactions, et cetera, need to be closely observed. I can start that off and then I'll pass it off to Trina. Um, I think this is a great question. I think this is the kind of question that um, as a qualitative community, we, we need to be debating about and reflective about. Um, from my own perspective, my answer is yes to that. Um, I think it's really important as qualitative researchers that we resist um, temptation to rely upon kind of mainstay understandings of where meaning making happens as the only way we collect data. So historically, we have positioned face-to-face -face interactions, most often through the collection of face-to-face of -face interviews as the primary way that we can make sense of people's Kind of emotional responses, their everyday experiences, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, in my own work, that's certainly been something I've drawn upon in my own work. And one place that I've been really challenged to rethink this uh, has actually been in the, the critical disability studies scholarship that's offered some pretty strong critiques of traditional qualitative understandings of emotionality, um, everyday experience, and noting that our very methods are often built on some assumptions about what it even means to display emotion and what it even means to make meaning. Um, and so I think that, you know, thinking about digital spaces and digital tools also offers a challenge. Um, does that mean that emotion can't be expressed in those places? And or can we argue that um, what's happening there is also meaningful? It's obviously not the same, um, but uh, there is something meaningful unfolding there. Um, so we can really make sense of it. Um, and again, it's not the same, um, but that's really, you know, one of the things that we can think about is, is given the purpose of our, of our research, if the purpose is to explore something and it's bounded within a particular context, um, then obviously um, that context going to, is going to shape uh, the interactions that we gain access to and the, the data that we gain access to. Trina, do you want to add? Yeah, just like just what you were saying is that, you know, I think you have to be careful using face to face as the default um, and that somehow everything norms back to in person, especially now. And when we think about how long our inter human interactions have been mediated by technology um, decades now um, and that there's this idea out of instructional design and technology me media comparison studies where people get really wrapped up in which is better online or offline. 
um, which is more authentic online or offline. And that, that line of research has been somewhat debunked by the no significant difference phenomenon in that the real issue is what are you trying to accomplish? And in that particular space, um, how is that space shaping the way that you accomplish it? And so it's, it's just different. It's not that things don't exist in one place or another, that it's better or worse. It's that different contexts afford um, or have consequences with, with what happens in those spaces. So they are events in, in and of, you know, I guess, into themselves. Great. Um, so in terms of data protection issues, does the use of new technology and qualitative research add another layer of complexity around ethical is issues such as consent, particularly in social media? Yeah, I can start us off on this. Yes, <laughs> um, a, a great go-to place for uh, the Association of Internet Researchers have been thinking and writing about this issue for a very, very long time. And they're like on their third edition of ethical guidelines for working with what we now call social media data. But really, you know, we've been doing this since the early 90s, just online conversations of all different types. Uh, we talk about it in this book as well. Um, that yes, um, issues around um, who do you ask for permission to treat um, online data sources as data and what are some of the variables and what are some things to consider, um, such as how publicly accessible is it or is it behind a login screen? How vulnerable are the people who are talking? What are their expectations of privacy? Do you even know who they are in real life that you could ask for informed consent? So yes, there's a lot of considerations, but also a lot of writing, really good scholarly writing around how to guide you in that process. So you're not really starting from nothing, which is which is great. Great, thank you. Here's a, another question. When using social media and other online content as part of research, are there ways to automatically anonymize social media content when pulling it into a software like Invivo? Any ethical considerations when using this content? Um, I'll just jump in again here. Uh, yeah, you hire you hire somebody who can do computer programming to do that for you. And that's, you know, so the, these are the questions that are not always in our skill set as qualitative researchers. Now, some of us are really good at this sort of thing, but yes. Um, now, I don't know that there's any tool that is, uh, there may be tools out there that exist that can help you with this, but also if you can collaborate with someone who can write a computer script to do this very quickly, um, or if it's a small enough data set, you could possibly do it by hand. Um, there are, we do have some links in the book as well with some websites that kind of send you to existing tools who can do some of this work up front. And Jessica, I don't know if you've had any students who've had success um, finding good tools for this area, in this area. No, I've only had one student that worked with a, um, a a super techie person to help them write code to do this, uh, particularly with large asynchronous data. Great. Um, so uh, there are some questions about in vivo use, and what I can do is show you um, at the end after questions the uh, places on our website to go to to get a lot of information about that. Um, Here's a question on how do we address the, uh, and I wouldn't say some of these wrong, um, ontological and epistemological issues that come from evolving digital experiences of people. Can I you can start? Definitely. Yeah, go um, ahead, Jessica. I didn't quite catch it, but go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I don't know if I, I, I said all the words right. <laughs> yeah, I can repeat it. How do we address the ontological, O-N-T-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, and epistemological issues that come from the evolving digital experience of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in our second book, um, this new book that's coming out, we do take this up, um, and it, um, in some ways it was illustrated in, in, in um, the examples that we offer today. Um, and what we are really arguing is the way we engage and and um, making sense of these evolving ontopistemological kind of intersections with people's meaning making practices and our practices as qualitative researchers um, is to first and foremost, uh, before we engage in the research process itself, really spend some time um, theorizing um, the technologies that might intersect in our research workflow. Um, and then, of course, you know, as qualitative researchers, we often all also draw upon other substantive theories. Um, so 
that's one of the ways, but then embedded throughout this, um, we really argue for the need to engage in just a commitment to recursively being reflexive um, about the implications um, around meaning making, um, how people come to know, how knowing is intersecting with technologies, how our knowing is intersecting with technologies, how our way of being, um, kind of our own ontological positioning is intersecting with the technologies that we may leverage in our own research practice and the same goes for participants and really how that's all embedded um, and so what we argue is is the need to remain um, ever recursive but also critically appraise um, the technologies that we might take up in our work um, or that participants might be taking up in the work and assume that that nothing is neutral uh, and that there there is some kind of impact or shaping great um, so I'm just going to do one more question because of time. Uh, so what are the best practices for getting around issues of sampling and reliability in digital research? Um, I don't know that we ever get around <laughs> those issues. Um, you know, there's a different sort of, there's a difference between digital spaces, which is where we think about social media or existing, pre-existing conversations as a potential data source. And that might be where this question is coming from versus you can also think of digital tools which put traditional methods like interviews and focus groups and observations in online spaces. If you actually have control over who your participants are, like you want to conduct interviews, you want to do focus groups, um, you want to do observations, then, then you can actually, you know, intentionally sample or choose participants to meet whatever criteria your research design requires because you know, these issues are highly integrated with what your ontological and epistemological assumptions are as well as what methodology you're working with and we we talk through that in the book if the if the question is really about if you want to treat online conversations and social media as a data source the reality is you never know who is really talking in those spaces you don't know who they are um, unless you have control over the spaces and you're putting people in there for the purpose of research um, if you're looking at, at existing spaces, um, the sampling becomes more difficult, um, but there are ways to um, think through that process. So sort of like with ethical practices, um, how you decide who your participants are going to be or what you're going to treat as data has sort of a whole series of decision, make, decision points uh, that we need to consider um, and acknowledge and just be very transparent about um, in our writing. Jessica, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, just to concur, I agree. I, I don't think there's any way around it. Um, I think, you know, taking up those ideas that Trina offered and then also, again, turning to the broader methodological literature um, around um, establishing quality, I think can be useful, even if it's not written in the context of digital spaces. I do think we always want to also keep in mind that um, there's a wealth of, of ways of thinking about quality in general and then thinking about how that might intersect in a new research space um, is the job that's upon all of us now. Great. Well, thank you both of you and there are a ton of great questions um, and uh, uh, some I can answer myself um, but um, I'm, I think I, a lot probably are in the book, <laughs> the answers, so that's one way you, you can get some answers and I just wanted to quickly uh, go to our website um, and just show some resources about how to learn um, in vivo. So under resources tab, um, we have a lot like the live webinars we're doing now, but we have a ton of on-demand webinars. Uh, one I actually um, did myself, which um, let me see where it is, it should be here. Um, there's a three, oh, three part uh, overview demo series. So it, it's the, they're about 15 minute long videos that show you how to use in vivo. Um, we also have the in vivo community can join the podcast. Um, and then under support, we have our customer hub, which has a lot of good resources too to learn. And then of course, in vivo Academy where there's courses you can learn. Uh, people had questions about um, the product. So for transcription and collaboration, um, you can get trials of these by going to the website. So feel free to do that. And we will be sending an email um, to everyone uh, with the recording um, and a thank you for joining. And uh, when we upload the recording 
to the website as an on-demand webinar. You'll also have access to the slides if, if you didn't get them, but the slides are still in the handout section here. And I'm trying to think of any other questions. Um, but I think, I think that's it. So thank you, Jessica and Trina. We appreciate your time for joining us. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.